morning, church. How we doing? Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Man, uh, if this is your first time here, I'm Pastor Luke Williams. I'm the lead pastor here at St. Andrews, and we're just really so grateful you've chosen to worship with us today, especially for our first time guests. We know how it is nerve wracking watching, that's right, walking into a church for the very first time. Well, hey, we're going to be getting into the word. We're going through our series in uh, the book of 1 Peter. And uh, before we get in, I mentioned this last week, um, it's important for us, I'll tell you one of the things we want to do is resource you the best that we can. So if you need a Bible, now one, here's the deal, you can follow along with us on the screens up here, but if you need a Bible, there's Bibles uh, in chairs in front of you, if there's a little chair with like a little slanty, I don't know, like a cage that's <laughs> at the bottom of those chairs there's a there's a bible under there and if you go hey i don't have a bible uh take that that that's our that's our gift to you so today we're going to be looking at first peter and we're going to be in uh we're going to be in chapter three so first peter three and we're going to be starting in verse 13. first peter three starting in verse 13. and it says this it says now who is there to harm you even who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed have no fear of them nor be troubled but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ may put you may be put to shame for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil wow what a bummer let's go to good lord in prayer real quick father thank you for your word lord i pray that our hearts and minds would be open to what you want to say to us today we pray all these things in Jesus mighty name amen Wow, what an encouraging word. Hey, are you being oppressed and suffering? Deal with it. That's what it, that's what it sounds like coming from 1 Peter. Or we're coming out of the book of 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter. Remember, he's writing to these churches all throughout uh, Asia Minor. And we know that their, their situation, they are dealing with some oppression. They are dealing with suffering. They are dealing with attacks on those churches. And so he's writing to them. And the very first week, we, he, his message to them was, I know you're going through this, but put your hope fully on the grace of Christ. That's, that's number one. Put your hope fully on the grace of Christ. So today, we, we, we remind ourselves that our hope can be divided, and we have to put it fully on Christ. No matter what we are dealing with, no matter what we are walking through, fully on the grace of Jesus Christ. And then the second thing, when, we, when he said, now put your hope fully on Jesus Christ, he goes, this is why you do it. Remember, you are walking in a, you're living in a new life. You've been saved through Jesus, so now your identity is in following in the ways of Jesus. And so leading up to this, the end of chapter 2, going into, the, going into chapter 3, what Peter is telling them is now you live a new life. Now these are the actions that you take within that new life. And what he does is he starts walking through all the ways in which we are to honor other people. Now, he doesn't start going through all these different commands. He does tell them, he goes, now, leave aside this. We were, last week we said malice, deceit, you know, hypocrisy. Those no, those no longer belong in this new life. But now in this new life is love and compassion. And he says how, we, how that's displayed is in how you honor people, how you honor other Christians, how you honor the people you like. No. How you honor the government and in that day, they were under an emperor. How you honor your wife, how you honor your husband, how you honor your neighbor, how, how servants were to honor their master. Because he goes, remember, your hope is fully in Christ, both in what is present and what God will do in the future. 
The full consummation, the creation project reaches its pinnacle from garden to garden in the new heaven and the new earth. All will be saved, all will be restored. But right now you are sitting in the hope of that restoration while also experiencing the present restoration and redemption of your soul. What Peter said, you're growing into salvation. He didn't say, hey, go get saved if you know that evangelical language, right? Hey, don't just go, don't just ask Jesus into your heart. Or walk the Roman road. He goes, no, you have to grow into salvation. Which is interesting because that's not really language that we use often, but it's in the Bible, so I guess we should use it, right? Good. One of us is cool with that. The rest of us will think on it. That's fine. Y'all let me know after lunchtime. Growing into our salvation. So as we're looking at this, one of the questions that I, as I'm reading through 1 Peter 3 in that passage we just read... He keeps talking about good, the good conscience, be the good for the sake of, for the sake of good. And when you think about the subject, when you think about a good life, what are the things, you don't have to answer out loud, this is rhetorical. Sometimes we forget that in a Pentecostal setting, you know what I'm saying? I ask questions and it's like, yeah, well, yeah, it's fine. If you want to answer, that's fine too. I'm cool with it. I'm really, really good with it. I got three kids. They talk all the time. When you think about the good life, what is, the, what is a good life to you? And a lot, for a lot of us, it's, it's lots of money. That sounds, like, that sounds fun. That sounds real nice. Good health? Yes, praise God. I'd like to not have sleep apnea. You know what I'm saying? I'd love that. Good, a good marriage? And I've been blessed with that. My wife's present, so, so it's so perfect, y'all. I'm very blessed. Good friends? When we think about the good, the good life, they're, they're, individualistically, there's some different ideas that, that conjure up. But most of the time when we talk about descriptions of the good life, a lot of times they are idealistic fantasies. They're not real. Pastor, are you saying I can't have lots of money? I mean, you can. Sure. Are you saying I can't have good health? Well, you could. Sure. Absolutely. Are you saying that I can't have a good marriage? Yeah, absolutely, you can have a good marriage. Are you saying I can't have good friends? Yeah, absolutely, you could have good friends. Are you saying I can't just enjoy life? No, that's not what I'm saying. You can have those things. But what we know and what Peter knows is the real good life isn't based on just comfortable, conflict-free, non-suffering living. Peter is telling them, he goes, oh, are you feeling suffering? Are you feeling the hardships of life? That's normal. It's normal. He didn't give, he didn't write them some feel good, like, hey guys, you're gonna get through it. It's all good. You're gonna be fine. Because what if they weren't fine? Sometimes we're not fine. Even, man, I'm telling you what, how many times are we gonna hear about the healthiest people we know all of a sudden die of a health crisis? I don't know how many times I've heard of people who run marathons and eat, you know, who are super crunchy. They basically just eat grass clippings and then all of a sudden they have a heart issue. How many times do you know the super wealthy, prude, shrewd businessmen and all of a sudden the business collapse? How many of you know, how many marriages do we know of people who dedicate themselves to the life of Christ and they come to church only to find out that their their spouse has been cheating on them? How many times do you have friends that you have developed and molded and have lived life with together only to have them slander? You find out they slandered you behind your back. Yes, you can have those things, but what Peter's telling us is that's not the good life. Because if that's all it's going to be based on, you're going to eventually be let down. But the only way you're not going to be let down is when your hope is fully in the one person who won't let you down, Jesus Christ. That is the hope. That is the security. That is the foundation. What he said was the cornerstone. That all the others were deceived and tripped over, but those of us who have faith in Christ, who are in Christ, who are covered under his blood, we have a foundation on the cornerstone, and that cornerstone leads directly to a relationship with the divine, loving Father, the Creator, who's been loving you. 
What he says, too, in, when he talks about this good life, one of the things going back to 1 Peter 1, he goes, but, as, you were, but as, as he who called you is holy, talking about God, he's holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Oops. How many of y'all, how many of y'all have been super holy this weekend? 100%. Verse 16, he goes, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now we get this idea of, uh, we're going to go into this idea of holiness in just one second, but I want to move on to verse 17, because I want to, we're going to build up into something here. He goes, and if, you, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. We're exiles. We belong to the kingdom of God, yet the kingdom of God isn't fully consummated yet, so we are in this kingdom of the world. We were here, we talked about this last week. Who is the ruler of this world? The enemy. And Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. And so for those of us who are in Christ, who are followers of Jesus, then this is not our, we are exiles. Like Like the Israelites. We are pilgrims journeying through this world, on into, waiting, waiting for the eternal, the eternal consummation of all things. Then he goes on to say, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The apostle, the apostle Peter, he's realigning the price that was paid for our salvation. The new life, the good life, not with silver or gold, but with the blood of Christ. Now, if you're not, if you're new to the faith or you're you're new to this language, Jesus died, we believe Jesus died on the cross, and that according to the Old Testament law, his the shedding of his blood. What for, was the ability for us to be, offer the ability for us to be saved and all of our sins to be forgiven because he was the pure, spotless, sinless son of God. But he didn't buy it with silver or gold. He didn't buy it with the things of this world. He bought it with the pure blood that was shed as a sacrifice for you and me. Then Peter goes on to say, say he, or Peter doesn't go on to say something like, if you get saved, you're going to be okay. Once you're saved, this too shall pass. No, instead he goes on to say something like, hey, if you want a good life, live like Christ. Amen. And we go, awesome, yeah, I want to live like Jesus. <laughs> Hang tight. But living like Jesus comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. And now we love, well, I love Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. But when you start reading scripture, you realize what's be actually being asked of you. What's being asked of you is for you to lay down your life. Lay down your sense of what is right and what is wrong, what we would call righteous. And to live a life of holiness. But then we go on, we keep reading, and we learn that, oh, you and I can't live a holy life on our own. We can only live a life holy in relationship to Jesus Christ, who made us holy. You can't be holy on your own. So he's not saying, go out and do the right things. He goes, no, stay close to Jesus and learn and grow into the salvation that you were given. Stay close. Follow him. Don't stray. Look to him. And if if there's anything, and here's the deal, if there's anything that following Jesus looks impossible, that's not because it is impossible. It's that it's impossible separate from Jesus. And it's impossible in our fleshly current state because we have sinful, sinful minds influenced by a sinful world who is not interested in you and I rising to the level of living and holiness. But holiness is the good life. That's the good life. It's a free life. And the world mixes up this idea of what is free. But if you're taking notes today, what is good must be shaped by Christ. If you want to understand what is truly good, it must be shaped by what Jesus Christ says is truly good. Jesus didn't say, 
you can't have any money. He just says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. He's not saying you can't be wealthy. Because the very next chapter, when, he, when, when uh, Jesus says that in the book of Luke, in the very next chapter, we encounter a very rich man who was able to enter the kingdom of heaven because he was able to live a generous life. That's one example. That's one example. To the Pharisees, time and time again, they thought they were living holy lives. And Jesus said, you don't even understand what holiness is. Because it's not just about the right actions, it's about the right heart. Your heart has to change and be formed. And our heart is changed and formed by Jesus. So if you want the good, you have to find where Jesus is. You have to follow him. And in this life, there's this difference too. Let's keep on this idea of good. There's this difference between a good life and also what, a good, what good people are, right? We talk, there's this time, time and time again. Hey, does a good person truly need to be saved? Well, what do you mean by good? Well, they gave a lot to charity. Okay, why did they give a lot to charity? There's a lot of people that give to charity for all the wrong reasons. Well, they were super nice. Were they super nice? Or did you just not hear them say the things behind your back? The good is defined by Jesus, not this world. So both what you and I want to achieve in life, the good life, what goodness is a good person. What's a good person? Well, in the, when you're following Jesus, what do we find out? There's not really any good people. There's just sinful people that have been willing and chosen to allow God to do something inside of them. That's you and me. And, I, and, you, and you have these people go, well, you have to, I mean, you gotta give yourself some credit. Why should I give myself any credit? Because I am the reason I landed in the mess in the first place. I am, I am broken on my own. And it's only Jesus that redeems and restores. And that's the path that we're on. The good life is just the path that we've chosen to enter on. Over in Titus, I'm gonna jump back, Titus 3, 3 through 5. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, which is to do evil, and envy, which is to desire evil for someone else so we can have what they have, hated by others and hating one another. What a fun existence that was. And Titus said, that's you and me. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, not because we did the right things, but according to his own mercy. If you walked in here today thinking that you were some great and unholy person, you aren't separate from Jesus Christ. If you think you earned your way in this world, you didn't, except by the mercies of God. You are who you are. The li you have the life you have right now. You are here in this moment, breathing this air because of the mercy of God. And to think anything different, you might as well no longer call yourself a Christian and call yourself a Pharisee. Because the Pharisees thought that it was all on them. And it's not all on us. If you want the good life, you follow Jesus. If you want to live up to the holy life, you who follow Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. He goes, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Man, keeps coming up, doesn't it? In the Bible. And for some reason, us, us Christians, we, we choose to not have unity. But he says, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called. You were called to no longer repay evil for evil. You were called. If you're following Jesus, if Jesus is the way, 
If you've been saved, you no longer repay evil for evil. Another word for that is revenge. They deserve it. What do you deserve? That's the change of heart that we're called to. No longer repaying evil for evil. For this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. You want to be blessed? You want the good life? What were you called to? Who called you? Matthew 5, 43 says this way. This is Jesus teaching in what's known as the Sermon on the Mount that, that encompasses Matthew uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And this is 5 starting in verse 43. You've heard it said that you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is Jesus re repeating back to the Jewish religious leaders saying, you've taught this and this was, this was what we've taught before. And then verse 44, he goes, but I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Really? Really? That's what we're called to? To love our enemies? And you go, yeah, pastor, that's exactly what we're called to. Don't you want to do that? Do you want to do that? Do you want to pray for your persecutors? We don't hear that very often, do we? We live in a culture that's a... Not to, not to harp on this or whatever, but it, it's this kind of low-hanging fruit. We live in cancel culture, right? You do wrong, you're out. I've yet to hear on the news someone go, hey, this person did something really wrong. Let's unite as a nation and pray for them. Right? Maybe y'all have. I haven't. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's the deal. I have, I have yet to hear that. No. Love your enemies. What a dangerous thing to be told. What a dangerous thing we have been told to do. To love our enemies. And then he goes, love your enemies and pray for your persecutors so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. An identity. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, why would he do this? Why would he want us to do this? Before we get into the why, necessarily, I want to get into, remind us what we're talking about here. You've been, you've been called to live a holy life. And a holy life is one that does not repay evil for evil. A holy life prays for those who persecute us and, and desires good things and love towards those who are our enemies. And an enemy is anyone that wants evil done to you. We can think in grand, big, global scales, but there are enemies amongst us. There's enemies in your home, at your work. There certainly is when I go to Walmart. There are enemies amongst us. They want evil done to us. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to love them. And not just love he actually told us, you have to pray for them. Ooh, no thanks. But here's what we know when we start to follow Jesus. And this is the next thing I'm going to say today. If you're taking notes, a life shaped by Christ is one that endures. A life shaped by Christ is one that endures. The paradox of loving your enemy, it's just insane. Because going back, 1 Peter 2, 19, he says, For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. A gracious thing? We're suffering. This person's after me. This person wants to take from me. This person wants to harm me. And Peter goes, awesome. That's so good. What a gracious and wonderful thing. And then he goes on in verse 20. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. What does this all mean? It means if you follow Jesus, that means you follow him even when things don't feel good, even when it's painful, even when you're, he's telling you to pray for your enemy. And Peter goes, it is a blessing to receive that. And in the eyes of God, you are doing exactly what you were supposed to do.
Praise God for your suffering. Praise God that your life isn't easy. Praise God that health, wealth, and prosperity isn't the thing that came your way. Praise God, because that means God actually gets to do something inside of us. There's a blessing inside of that. Man, you're looking at me with some crazy eyes. I know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just reading the Bible today. I don't know what you want me to do. You told me you want to read the Bible more, and here we are. It's crazy stuff, isn't it? What a wild and dangerous calling. Dr. Robert Mulholland, he wrote this book on spiritual formation, and he defines what spiritual formation is. And it's this, a process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. Spiritual formation. What you have dedicated, what, you're, what you are doing here today to be spiritually formed is to be formed, molded, meaning things need to be taken out, things need to be added into the image of Christ and that's it? No, for the sake of others. It is always about what God wants to do through us. We are not being formed individualistically, but for the purpose of what the Bible calls good works. He has called you to do good works. But you can't do good works if you're going off of your idea of what good is. You have to be doing Jesus' version of good works. And Jesus' version of good works looks like praying for your enemies. Looks like accepting those who don't exactly look like us and talk like us and work like us and live life like us. Why? For their sake. In obedience to Jesus, for, th for their sake. Uh, Dr. Janet ha uh, Hagberg and Robert Gulick, they were pro they're professors at Fuller Seminary, and they studied thousands of Christians to try to understand what the, what the spiritual journey looks like for a mature Christian. How many of y'all want to be mature Christians? Good. Ten of us. That's awesome. Y'all meet me after service. We'll, uh, we'll work through this together. They call this the critical journey. There's a book that they have called The, the, the Critical Journey. And they, 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 they came up with six stages of the life of a, mature, of a maturing Christian. So stage one, they call the recognition of Jesus, salvation. That's really what that is, salvation. Things are new. And I would even say it this way, salvation or if you've, ever come, if you've ever left the faith and come back to the faith, that's that recognition of Jesus. You're starting anew, it's fresh. Then the next one is what they call the life of discipleship. So you're going to church regularly. You know, it's still things are so fresh and new. The worship team's still playing the songs you like, you know. It's fun. You're going. Maybe you're even joined a life group or, or, or some sort of Bible study. Maybe you're praying regularly in the morning. You're reading your Bible for the most part. Then they have what they call the productive life. So there's salvation, the life of discipleship, then what they call the productive life, which is like serving the church or serving the community. You're giving. You're really active within the body of the church. Yeah, yeah you got a productive life. And then the fourth stage, and this is where things get real hairy, it's called the journey inward. The journey inward. This is the fourth stage. So you've been going to church for a while. It's fun. You're, you're giving. You're a member. You're serving in the kids' ministry. You're loving it. But we, now we've gone on for a little while. We've gone on for a little while, and now we're in this fourth stage called the journey inward, and this is the unsettling part of this journey. By the way, this is stage four, and there's six. But stage four is usually where people stop. Because the journey inward, they say, is, is the part where your beliefs and ideas about God, about the Bible, about faith, start to get challenged some things start to happen to ha where those inward questions of, is God real? Or if God's so loving, why this? Why did this happen? Or I, you know, why does this, why I don't understand this, or I don't understand this. It's also another part to the journey inward is where you start to see your own brokenness. And this is, and here's the deal. You have two choices. Either you, either you continue that journey inward or 
you abandon it and start over at step one. Let me, let me give you an example. You're a new person and you come into our church. Maybe you like the worship, you like the preaching, you, you like the people. It's fun. A couple months later, you're part of the church. You're joining the membership. Oh, look at that. Now you're tithing. Praise God. That's awesome. Now you're serving with Pastor Harley over in youth ministry. We're six to nine months into this thing. It's great. You're going. And then one day you come into a, ch- a church service and you might be, and I read, and the scripture is read and it challenges or doesn't quite sit right. Or you meet another person and someone in the church says something to you that was not nice and it hurts your feelings. And you have that, that question of, well, I thought Christians were supposed to be this. And you have certain responses. You have some people that will abandon the faith entirely, or you'll do this. You'll just go to a new church and start over. And then you go to that new church. And then nine, to, nine months later to a year later, the same problems keep happening. And you, and you blame the churches that you're going to. But the truth is, you will not deal with what God is trying to deal with in your own life. And then you look back at 10 years, and you've gone to 15 different churches, and you, keep, you just go, well, there's just no good churches or pastors in this area. They're all hypocrites and sinners. Yeah, we are. <laughs> if you came in here thinking I wasn't, I am. Why? Because I'm a human, and I'm on the process of, I, I'm, I'm on this process, too, of maturing. I'm on this process, too, of healing. And if you don't enter into this, if you don't go deeper, you will stay an immature Christian. And let me tell you, the biggest detriment to the church is immature Christians. People, because really, you're not interested in following the ways of Jesus. You just follow the way of hype and good vibes making sure everything is just like you like it instead of actually dealing with your own brokenness and dealing with your own sin because we all have it we all have it this church is not a perfect church i love this church i love y'all y'all are are awesome i brag on y'all all the time but we're not perfect and the expectation can't be that we're going to be perfect in fact this is more of a practice this is more of an art form than a science they we're we're just showing up worshiping god And that's the great thing about our tradition is we're also real open to the Spirit of God moving. Because we know sometimes, even in in the the best preparation, sometimes God wants to do something specific and we're just open to that. Because we go, man, I didn't even see it coming. Divine leading. I love it. But we need a faith that endures. We need a faith that endures. And one of those things is... Can you pray for your enemies? Can you pray for them? Can you actually pray for them? Let me tell you what, there's a whole lot of enemies this week. Depending on where you voted on in the election, either you celebrated or you were upset. And I, like I told y'all many, many times, and if you're new here, I'm not the political pastor. And if you want one, I'm sure there's a real good political pastor down the street. That is not my job. I'm not some political operative. I'm a pastor. That's it. But let me tell you, how you treat people, how you actually treat, there's so many Christians and even people I love who I go, you're not, you're not very loving of your enemies right now. Either you're gloating or you're crying or you're blaming. And I have yet to see one person who didn't vote for a president ever go, I'm gonna pray for this president. I didn't see it in the last election. I didn't see it in the election before that. I didn't see the election before that. And I didn't see the election before that. All I heard were Christians and pastors going, the world's over, or God actually heard our prayers. And if that were true, then I guess the time that your guy didn't get voted in, that he didn't hear your prayers. I don't know, I guess, I guess your formula, the formula got right this time. You said the right magic words, good hocus pocus. No, that's not prayer and that's not faith. That, that, that's superstition. Can you pray for those who wish you harm? Or even if they don't even realize they wish you harm. Because if you want a mature Christian, because you, how you answer that is how you, endure, how you go into the inward journey. 
Because I'll be honest with you, there are people that I have a hard time praying for. And I have to go in and say, Holy Spirit, what is this? What is this in me? Why, why am I so opposed? Why can't I have grace and compassion for this person? Why? And usually, and let me tell you what, it's not a fun journey. It's a painful journey. But it's a journey that is worth taking. Because when you take that journey, then you go to the next stage, which is the journey outward. And here's how they describe it. This is the next stage after rediscovering God and accepting love, where things are deepened and freshened. You know, that some, there's some saints in this room. Y'all, y'all got to tell me, when, you, when God started to become bigger than you ever imagined, his love became bigger than you ever imagined, and it did something to you, didn't it? You go, oh, I'm not putting God in the box. He's showing me something. We are, he it goes on to say, we are fully surrendered with eyes wide open to the great and painful mysteries of life. And we now begin to reemerge from our inward journey with a fresh focus on others and a renewed sense of calling, but from a new grounded center and from a sense of fullness. We become aware that God's purpose for our inner lives is lived out in the world. What God's doing here, he wants to unfold in the world and in the lives of others. Remember, you are being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. We don't burn out. We live from a place of deep calm and stillness. And our inner stillness is the source of our outward journey. Let me tell you what, the most mature Christians are the ones who, are, who sit still within the waves who sit still within the chaos. We talked about chaos, didn't we? The ones who aren't worrying and wringing their hands like, oh goodness, what's gonna happen? No, they're the ones that go, I'm loved by God, you were loved by God, and no matter what happens, we will endure this moment. That's the journey outward. And that's just five. Here's six, a life of love. That's the result. In this stage, we reflect God to others more clearly and consistently than we ever thought possible. And we have entirely lost ourselves and yet have truly found ourselves in God. That is what we're going for. I wanna lose myself. I wanna lose myself and I wanna wanna, wanna lean back deep into the deep wells of the love of God so that I can be changed and cleansed and formed so that others may be affected. Remember what he said, have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Don't you want others to taste and see that the Lord is good? Then you gotta endure. You gotta stand firm. His last thing, and this is the last thing I wanna say to you. You have to live a life of invitation. Let's go back to the enemy's discussion. You and I, this is what Paul says actually, Romans 5, 10. He goes, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through through his life? You and I were the enemies of God, and yet he chose to meet us. And he's just saying, I want you to do the same. I want you to do the same for your enemies. I want you to meet them where they are. I want you to love them where they are. Sure, they're gonna frustrate you. Sure, you're gonna be angry. Sure, some of our enemies are gonna make us cry and weep. Some of our enemies are actually going to literally harm us. But I want you to love them in such a way that they are invited to the table. Why? So that you, they can be changed by the radical love of God. But you've got to endure. You have to stand firm. Your hope, a divided hope, is, an, a, is a church that is not enduring. It's an ununified church. It's a church that is being pulled apart. It's a church that has not taken off the clothes of the flesh and put on the clothes of the spirit. But it is a church that says, I hope God does this, but if not, I'll look to these other sources. It's a church that goes, I'm standing on the word of God. I believe what the word of God says. 
I'm just probably not going to love my enemies. I'm probably just not going to pray for them. That's not a church that endures. That's not a love that endures. And guess where you're going to start? Right back at stage one. You got to go find your new, you got to go find the new hype. You got to go find the new thing. No. No. It's when you remember that you were enemies. We were enemies of God. And he loved. If we are a people set apart for the purposes of God in order to do the will of God, then we will remind ourselves that we were once enemies of God, which only changed when we accepted the invitation of Jesus. And our lives should be an invitation to the only true good life. Our lives should be lived within the good life, inviting others into the good life. Let's stand across this place today. I'm going to invite our prayer team down right now. Let me say this, man. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ, today's the day. Today's the day to make that prayer. Today's the day to set that apart. And I want you to come down and pray with us. If you say, Pastor, I've lived a life separate from God, but I want to receive what he has. I know he's called me to holiness, and I thought that that was too high, but maybe today I see something possible if I would just fully surrender my life to Jesus. Come down. We're going to pray. If you go, Pastor, I am walking through a season of hurt. I'm going through a season of suffering, a season of oppression. Come down. We're going to pray because we're going to pray for the good life. We're going to pray for an enduring life. We're going to pray for a people that will stand firm in the face of an enemy that lies, who wants to steal, and who wants to destroy what God has already done in you and was going to do in you, but he wants to distract you from that moment. Today, we're going to pray. Let's bow our heads right now. Father, Lord, I pray for those who are far from you, those who want to return to you, those who need more of you. Father, right now, I pray that those who would pray the prayer of salvation would repeat after me, Father, Jesus, you are Lord. I repent of my sin. I want to be a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Let's step forward today. We're going to worship and pray, but we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to do some work in here. And if you don't have anything to pray for, or you don't need, then you stay, then let's worship God together. But if you do, step forward. Let's pray together. Worship team, lead us into this moment. Heal.